can't give it because the patient is on a beta blocker. Even though they're not, they're on the beta blocker for their heart, it's still beta, right? Yes. And so if we give them albuterol, the beta blocker is going to make the albuterol move, mean ineffective. Everybody with me? Everybody yes. understand what I'm saying? So now you got a choice. You know now you can give an anti-cholinergic drug. Do you want to give Spiriva, which lasts, is long acting, or do you want to give Atrovent, which is short acting, and you got a patient right in front of you, and their respiratory rate is increased to 32 breaths per minute, they're using their accessory muscles, and they're short of breath. Atrovent. That's what you do. They both do the same thing. One is, if you will, a rescue drug, and then the Spiriva would be longer acting. So they, so they could go home on Spiriva. Yes. COPD patients will be at home on Spiriva. That's the DPI. Mm -hmm. Are the anticholinergic drugs, are they usually the ones that COPD patients use versus the adrenergic drugs? If, if they're not on, um, I want to keep saying convivant, if they're not on respiratory, yeah. Okay. They could be on <sighs> Respiramat and <clears throat> Spiriva. And that Spiriva is a maintenance drug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. okay. So some of these drugs, because we've come such a long way, you as a respiratory therapist may not directly administer them, but you still need to know what they are. So when your patients come in, you have an idea. Because sometimes they'll ask you, why am I taking this drug? And you'll be able to tell them. Okay. Or why do I have to do, for lack of a better term, they won't know what a small volume nebulizer is, but why do I have to do this when I'm on this? And you can say, well, when you're at home, this is what you take, but now you're in the hospital, I'm administering the same thing, just in a liquid form. Because sometimes patients ask and they have a right to know. And it goes beyond just because the doctor ordered it, right? Okay, any other questions? Okay, I want you to turn to page 82. And then, it, well, actually, if you look on page 83, <coughs> at the very bottom, you see the subcategory anticholinergic agents. Okay, you can read that. It just reinforces everything we know. But here is atropine. Atropine is naturally occurring, and if you want to just understand a little bit more about it, but the focus in, the focus in on atropine, we just went over box 5-1. And it's a bronchodilation. Again, it's not direct acting. It's not front door. It's back door. And then uh, the treatment of bradycardia. That's what I really want you to know. Okay? Now, back to page 82. Cholinergic agents. We, as respiratory therapists, administering our drugs for patients, if you will, to breathe easy, won't use a cholinergic drug. But there's one drug, I thought about it, and I need to tell you, and it's appropriate right here, under table 5-3, on the bottom of page 82, go down to the 1, 2, 3, 4th drug, metacholine. Metacholine. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. That is a cholinergic drug. If you work in a PFT lab, pulmonary function testing lab, and I'm going to give you a, a specific example. Number one, this is a cholinergic drug. So patients who have certainly been diagnosed with asthma and or CPD, COPD, you would never ever give this drug to. We don't need to give this drug to them because we know their diagnosis, yes? Yes. Okay, but this drug, metacholine, is a drug, to give you a specific example, this is a drug, say, when the men are going, uh, what do you call it, taking a physical so that they can go to the armed forces. When they do their physical, they will go to a PFT lab, or that's part of their physical, to have a pulmonary function testing done. 
and they will receive this drug via a small volume nebulizer. And if they have any kind of allergies or if they have the slightest form of asthma, it's a cholinergic drug, so what is it going to do? Make them wheeze. Yes. They are not qualified for the armed forces. And this is metacholine, or the test itself is called bronco provocation, provoke the airway. And so this increases 3, 5 GMP. If an individual has healthy lungs, if they're not asthmatic, it won't do anything to them. They're good to go for the armed forces. So it is a cholinergic drug. So we never ever would administer this to an asthmatic or a COPD patient, right? right. But healthy individuals, and we want to see if they want to determine uh, if they have a hypersensitive airway, give them a cholinergic drug. You'll find out. So in the process of giving them this drug, what would the PFT lab or the respiratory therapist have to have available? An epi. Have an epi available? What else? Have a bronchodilator available? What else? Oxygen. It has to be there. Not that we're going to use it, but if the patient, we don't know if the patient has severe allergies or if the patient is going to manifest bronchospasms, right? But we have to have EpiPens there. We have to have a beta-2 agonist there, probably albuterol, whatever. And then we have to have oxygen just in case if they take this drug, metacholine, and it does provoke hypersensitivity, and they do begin to wheeze, we have to give them something. We just can't say, okay, go home. You can't go to the Army. We have to take care of them right there. So as respiratory therapists in an acute care setting, you won't administer this drug. But if you work in a full diagnostic PFT lab, you perhaps can administer this drug. Metacholine, and it's called bronchoprovocation. That's provoke the airway. And if they're not asthma, asthmatic, they don't have COPD, they're fine. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a cholinergic drug. This increases 3,5 GMP. We want to see if they're weak. If they don't have any asthma, if they don't have any allergies, if their airway is not hypersensitive, it's like taking candy. You know how some people are allergic to penicillin and some people can take penicillin forever and a day. So this would be the individual big deal, 3-5 GMP, and <laughs> But if they have the slightest form of asthma, and hopefully young men won't have COPD anyway. This metacholine drug, this cholinergic drug, will irritate their airway and shut it down. And then therefore, unfortunately, they're not qualified for the armed forces. Okay, armed forces don't take asthmatic patients. Yeah, they want to kill the best. <laughs> <laughs> no, they want everybody to breathe easy. Okay, so it's called metacholine, and it's direct acting. Metacholine. There's a few others below when we get to the respective pathophysiology, like the one now, I'm not holding you to it, like the last one, Edrophonium. That's a drug we use to uh, test and confirm myasthenis gravis, but I won't hold you to it until we get there. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I have a question in regards to what type of medications should be administered to a COPD patient. So if you have a COPD patient, they can't have the saliva by itself unless it's used synergistically with an anti drug, right? And more than likely, the physician after a while would take them off the lava and and put them on the spiriva. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it, has, it can't be used by itself. Right. As far as related to that. It has to be used with cortical.
or steroids if it's a lot of or use the um, Anti-cholinergic drug that is used with the solid. Yeah, and that is the patient if the patient is compliant. Now, if you got a patient and the doctor has ordered that regimen, but they keep smoking, it's not going to be effective long. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the ones we'll see in the, you'll see in the hospital call frequent flyers. And ultimately, when they come in, then we're going to have to give them the solid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good way to look at it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I've given you yes. Um, are Saba and Lava, is that, does that apply to both anticholinergic and? No. Okay. No. It only applies to? Long-acting beta-2 okay. agonists. Short-acting beta-2 agonists. That's okay. the sympathetic nervous system. Yep. All right. We call them Labas and Sabas. I didn't make that up. <laughs> I did not. I can come up with some doozies, but I didn't make that up. <laughs> That's a term that the, um, uh, I want to say asthmatic, whatever, made up. The asthma folks made it up. All right. Okay, so now we know you've learned one cholinergic drug. It's metacholine, and see the choline in it? Acetylcholine, see it? It increases 3,5-GMP. We would never, ever give it to an asthmatic or COPD patient. It's contraindicated, yeah? Yes. We know it's going to make them wheeze and probably kill them. So an example that I gave you is they'll use this drug to test individuals to see if they're healthy enough to go to the armed forces. <clears throat> if they begin to wheeze, they're not eligible. And whomever the therapist is in that, we have to make sure, again, that we have EpiPens, we have to have oxygen and we have to have beta-2 agonists and prepare to administer it if necessary. And then also, when this drug is administered, the physician, the physician has to be around. The physician may not be in the room where the PFT is being done, but a physician has to be in the vicinity. Has to. Just like cardiac catheterization. When that process is going on, a physician is somewhere around. When patients are take cardiac stress testing, physician has to be around somewhere. May not be in the room, but they're around. Have to. Okay. Any questions with this? Yes. Okay. With the paracetamolytic anticholinergic and antimicronic being backdoor, that decreases three five GMP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Can everybody answer those questions? Like you know what I'm doing. Can everybody answer those questions that I gave you on Blackboard? I added more. A lot of them are saying the same thing. I just ask it a different way. I can ask the same thing ten different ways. And the answer doesn't change. So if you have a pencil in your hand, you can't take the eraser and erase it and put another answer. Hint. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to go over that on page 82 because I said, how can I forget about that? Okay. Now, back to this pulmonary function testing. How do we know that drugs are effective for the asthmatic or the COPD patient? We know that they have an obstructive disease. We know their primary problem is a problem with expiration. So we look at values that are that assess expiration. Force vital capacity, FEV1, FEV2, FEV3, and peak expiratory flow rate. All of these, and this is this. All of these is this. How much of the exhale force vital capacity did they exhale in one minute? I'm, I keep saying, sorry, one second. second, two seconds, three seconds. That's what these are. And there are values to it, but I'm not going to hold you to it right now because you learn, we're, we're learning pharmacology. There's value to this, but we'll do that next semester. All these values will be decreased. 
now. We call it a before and after bronchodilator. Sometimes patients um, may not be on a certain regimen, but the doctor will order, pulmonary pulmonologist or primary physician will order for them to go have a PFT done. As a therapist, you would do the PFT and get these results before you give them a bronchodilator, and the results are probably going to be lousy. You let them rest, and then maybe five minutes you give them a small volume nebulizer treatment, probably with albuterol. Okay? You wait about 10 to 15 minutes after they've had the albuterol, then you do another PFT. And if that bronchodilator is effective, you're going to see the re results improve. Make sense? We call it a before and after PFT. We may not say before and after bronchodilator. You know what that means. Mean to do a PFT before you give the bronchodilator, do a PFT after you give the bronchodilator. And what we're hoping to see is an improvement on the second PFT. Right? Now, honestly, if you have an asthmatic or a COPD patient, you never look for normal results. <coughs> You're never going to see it. But <coughs> you may see an improvement. And that's what we want to know. And that way, we, the physician can tell, and we can tell too, whether that drug is going to be effective or not. I seem to recall, I may be crossing wires here, that we are normally, we are normal circumstances, looking for a 20% increase in these vital capacities. But with a COPD then, or an asthma patient, we won't probably get that 20%? Mm -hmm. Because uh, with the asthmatic, you can expect greater improvement, but with the COPD, based on the lung damage, and it's irreversible, you may see uh, an 8% improvement, which is a great improvement, but it's never what the values will never return to normal. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Understood. Understood? Okay. And then if the patient continues to smoke, those values are going to steadily decline. That's for sure. Okay. So a forced vital capacity is sucking in a slow, deep breath holding it maybe for two or three seconds, and that's hard for COPD patients. That is not easy breathing for them. And then blowing it out fast and hard and deep as they can. Keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing. The values are going to be decreased because they have a problem with exhaling, and then you all have learned a term, I believe you have air trapping. Mm -hmm. I, I, I refer to it, or CO2 retention. The air remains trapped in their alveoli because it can't get out, right? right? And so these values are going to be markedly decreased. And then for the asthmatic, we don't generally do this for COPD patients, but for the asthmatic, we can give them a peak expiratory flow rate meter. We can give them a flow meter, not that kind of flow meter, peak flow meter. And they can assess, we educate them, I see your hands, we can, uh, they can learn how to assess their own peak flow, and they do it in the morning. Green light, whatever you're doing is good. Yellow light, the doctor may say, if when you do your peak flow and it's between this and this, which is the yellow range, you perhaps need to add something else. And then if it's red, get to the hospital immediately. Okay? And so you, as respiratory therapists, will teach people how to use peak flows. What are you going to do? You're going to teach them, and you've got to train them, because remember, the preferred method of breathing is through what? The mm -hmm. nose. But when you do a peak flow, you can't breathe through the nose. You've got to breathe through your mouth. So you may need a nose clip to train them that forces them to breathe through their mouth. And you teach them to take in a real deep breath and blow. And the best, generally, with peak flows, you tell them to do three. And whichever of the three is the best, that's what they record. So their average or what they should be able to do will be based on their age, height, weight, rip, sex, and, um, 
age, height, weight, ethnicity, sex, and race. race. Not ethnicity, race. Yeah, race. Yes, ma'am. It was just interesting. My boyfriend's grandmother has emphysema, and I was over at her house yesterday, and she was telling me, well, she's on a home O2 device, mm -hmm. but she was blowing out for me. She was exhaling, and I could just see it like she was having. It was just interesting to see it for Sam. Like she was, her mouth was shaking, and she was really having a hard time. Did she? Getting the air out. Yeah. That's she, called purse lip breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She had her lips pursed, and she was just. It was really difficult for her. Yeah. And what happens is everybody take your mouth and do like me. And now exhale through it. What that does for a COPD, sometimes we have to train them to do it or sometimes they'll automatically do it. Pregnant women will do it too, the last trimester of their pregnancy. What happens is they have a problem exhaling and that air is not going to come out, right? But if they're so short of breath, they'll begin to exhale too fast, and then potentially their airways can collapse. Does that make sense? <coughs> Not that the, air, the airways will collapse because the air is stuck down in their alveoli and can't get out. So what they'll do, they'll do what's called purse lip breathing like we just did, and they'll create a back resistance to slow down their exhalation to keep their airways from collapsing. But what you'll see, did you see her neck veins distended? Yeah. Yep. She, her lips were like shaking. As she yeah. And bet you, buddy, maybe you couldn't see it, she was using her accessory muscles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So all those are clinical manifestations, what we're going to see. We're going to see the neck vein distension. We may not see this with an asthmatic, but definitely a COPD patient. We're going to see the purse lip breathing. And when it gets bad, they'll whistle with it. When I say whistle, I don't mean literally whistle like at a, a football game, but because it's hard for them to exhale. You'll see. And they may, their skin may be cool and clammy to touch, and we understand why. And we'll see them use their accessory muscles both on expiration. It first started on expiration, then it'll go to inspiration. Yeah, you'll see that. Okay, purse lip breathing is a common manifestation of a COPD patient, or it could be a pregnant woman, you know, in her tri uh, last trimester because the baby is pushing against her diaphragm and it's not much room. And if the baby is growing, the diaphragm kind of loses out, right? And so they struggle sometimes with breathing as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, you'll see it. You'll definitely see it. And then after she delivers the baby, she's fine. All right, any other questions? Okay, so everybody can answer those questions on Blackboard. Announcements. Okay. Okay, so I went through Metacoline. And I just want to tell you, you may have a patient. Let's look again at 5-3, table 5-3 on 82. Under direct acting, look at clinical uses. It says ophthalmic myotic glaucoma. Mm -hmm. Okay, these drugs, increase 3, 5, GMP, cholinergic drugs, are used for glaucoma. And that's literally hypertension in the ocular area, in the eye. That means systemically a person has hypertension, but they have hypertension in the eyes. And so cholinergic drugs, are the first choice drugs to lower the pressure in the eye. Okay, and so cholinergic drugs, here's a list, I don't expect you to know them, are used to treat glaucoma. But what happens if you got an asthmatic or a COPD patient that has glaucoma? They cannot take these drugs. And does everybody understand why? Yes. yes. These drugs, cholinergic, is antagonistic, meaning it'll make the beta-2 effect moot. So there's other type of drugs that they will now administer to patients that have glaucoma. And so one of the first things an ophthalmologist will ask the patient if they've been diagnosed with glaucoma, do you have any breathing problems? Do you have asthma? 
do you have COPD? They have to know that. Because as they begin to take these drugs to lower the ocular pressure in the eye, it's going to make them wheeze like little trains. Yes. Yeah, when I had an eye injury, they checked me for all that stuff. The, uh, the provocation, the bronchoprovocation drug, they checked me for that. Mm -hmm. Because they had to administer, there was pressure in the eyeball. Mm -hmm. I was on all those, well as on a couple of them anyway. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that's why. Because it cancels, it's, it's, it, these drugs are antagonistic to beta-2 agonists, meaning it makes it move. So if a person does have glaucoma uh, that has asthma or COPD, they can't take this classification of drugs. There's other drugs now that they administer, but it's, that's why it's very, very important. And I'm saying this because perhaps you may have elderly patients in your family, and if they have emphysema like your boyfriend's grandmother, whatever, she, she can't take the cholinergic drug to treat her glaucoma because it'll make her wheeze and probably kill her. It prob literally, they'll have a respiratory rest. May not happen the first time, but it'll be a uh, progressive increased work of breathing and they'll struggle tremendously. Okay? All right. So this is why uh, Kendra asked me back, I think the first or second week, and I don't remember how she phrased it, but doctors have to probe. Physicians have to ask because they need to know. They may be a, a physician in ER or a particular area, but they need to know. And it's important for patients. They may not understand 3, 5, G, and P, and A, and P, and our thing that we're understanding, but they need to know what their diagnosis is. It's really, really scary to have an asthmatic not know they're asthmatic. It's really, really scary to have a COPD patient not be able to say, yes, I'm COPD. Whether they understand the full ramifications of that, we have to educate patients, not in just this area, everything. And I mean, it's not anything they walk around with a sign on, I'm COPD, la, la, la. You need to know. People need to know why they're taking medication. And if you don't know why you're taking the medication, you need to ask. If your parents, your great-grandparents, grandparents, whomever, if they don't know why taking me they're taking medication, go to the doctor with them. Find out. Because if they go somewhere else, another physician can prescribe something else, and it can be antagonistic to the drug, and then they're sick. Right? If not running backwards, barking at the moon. Drugs are very, very important. Okay. Okay, next what I want to do is I want to move to Chapter 8. We're moving right along. And you guys are going to love me for this. <laughs> Xanthine drugs. Methoxanthines. Look on page something, 135. Look under the key terms and definitions. And that second term, methoxanthine. See it? Yes. What does xanthine mean? It means a color yellow. This is called theophylline, not theophylline. It's theophylline. The generic name is theophylline. The trade name is aminophylline, not aminophylline. Aminophylline. So, trade name is theophylline. May have two million, and <coughs> does it have two L's in it? Yes. Yes. yes, I thought so. It didn't look right. I told you I wouldn't do good on Twitter reports. All right. <laughs> Generic name is Theophylline. Trade name is Aminophylline. Here we go. Jessica, side door Bronco dilator. <laughs> Trade name Theophylline or? No, generic name Theophylline. Okay. Trade name Aminophylline. Side door bronchodilator. Okay. 
under uh, page 135, chapter 8 reviews the pharmacology of xanthine drugs such as theophylline. Theophylline traditionally has been used to treat patients with asthma and COPD in stable and acute phases. Okay. Below that in italics in the key point, theophylline and its salt, aminophylline, your trade name, are members of methylxanthine groups. I just want to tell you that. And then to the far right, theophylline has been traditionally used in the management of asthma. And I want to tell you, and it'll say later on in here, because I read this chapter this morning, questionable about COPD. And the reason I say questionable, in the past it was used for COPD, but now we don't have to use it so much for COPD, because we have wonder drugs like Atrovent and Spiriva. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So more so today, even though the book says COPD, more so today asthma because we have Spiriva and Atrovent for COPD patients. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay, how does it work? Although theophylline is usually classified as a bronchodilator, it is a relatively weak bronchodilator effect compared with a beta-2 agonist. I'm at the top of page 136. So that's why we call it side door. Methylxanthines by themselves are not bronchodilators. So what is that saying to you? It's synergistic. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Okay. All of you should have a handout that I gave you with key terms to know in pharmacology. Then I had this wonderful diagram at the bottom. Pull that, I don't know what color it is, but pull it out. Yeah, no, no, that's medical terms, no. It, oh, it's yellow, okay, it's a beautiful yellow color. Yeah. And if you don't have it, you can look at the bottom of page 138. And it's only for those individuals that are visual. It's yellow, everybody see it at the bottom? Okay. So what we have, what we're going to do is, well, we, this is at cellular level, right? And what you have there, my granddaughter did this for me. I even paid her. This chick is good and did it for media and websites and all that stuff. So I said, ooh, I paid her. She said, I can do this. I said, okay, do it. She did it. I challenge her. It's like I challenge you. This is a cell membrane. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> this is a cell membrane, so you have that cell membrane on your diagram. That's what that is. The drug has got to get to the cell whatever way, whether inhalation or whatever, and the drug has got to get inside the cell. So inside the cell membrane, you have adenocyclase, and when I see adenocyclase, I know that's the sympathetic nervous system, right? Yeah. If it was a parasympathetic nervous system, it would be guinocyclase. That's where the AMP and the GMP come from. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So we administer a beta-2 drug. And our beta-2 drug is outside the cell. Yes? Mm -hmm. But now the beta-2 drug goes inside the cell and it combines with adenocyclase. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Now further in, when it combines, you have... 3,5, when you got adenocyclase in here, what does ACE mean? Enzyme. 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 Speed up a reaction. Here comes our beta-2 drug. Where did it come from? We administered it, right? Whether MDI, DPI, small body nebulizer, we gave it to the patient. So here's the beta-2 drug coming to the cell. Inside the cell is adenocyclase and it's an enzyme. Let's make things happen. All right. So when the beta-2 drug gets inside the cell, it does this. At resting state, it was just this, 5-A and P. 
but now the beta-2 agonist has gotten inside the cell along with this enzyme, and so now we got 3,5-AUP. Make sense? And what's that? That's uh, uh, bronchodilation. That's bronchodilation. That's the purpose of us administering the drug at cellular level for this, right? Make sense? Everybody with me? Yep. All right. So after the peak effect, it doesn't matter whether it's short-acting, ultra-short-acting, or long-acting. You know, under homeostatic circumstances, the sympathetic nervous system lies dormant, yes? And when it is activated, we're given a beta-2 drug. We want bronchodilation. It increases the heart rate. It makes the heart pound. The blood pressure goes on. And that can't go on forever, right? We have to, our body has to relax. So after the peak effect of that drug, okay, the peak effect of that drug, what happens is that drug, the peak, after it reaches its peak effect and it causes bronchodilation, then that drug has to be metabolized through the liver and then we excrete it, right? Mm -hmm. So then, let's say if it's a, not ultra short acting, if it's a saba, maybe we have to administer that drug every three hours, every four hours, have to do it again. And then this would happen again. And then after this effect is over, it's 5 A and P, right? Okay. What stops this? Well, there's another enzyme that comes that's in our body, it's called phosphodiesterase. Does everybody see that on there somewhere? Mm -hmm. All right. What does ACE mean? Enzyme. ACE is an enzyme. So phosphodiesterase comes in and its responsibility is to stop this effect. And it's not a bad thing. Okay, you've taken the drug. The drug has done what it's supposed to do. Now that effect has to stop. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So phosphodiesterase comes in and it blocks the effect of 3,5 AMP and then this cell goes back to 5 AMP and that means the sympathetic nervous system <coughs> is lying dormant again. Everybody with me? Do I need to repeat it? Because we're not done. Repeat, one repeat what part? The last part. The last part? Okay. After you have a peak effect mm -hmm. of any drug, whether short-acting, long-acting, or ultra-short-acting, after it reaches its peak effect, that drug has to be metabolized through the body and get out. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we have to go back, whether it's two hours, six hours, or 12 hours, and give another drug. Okay, because the drug is only going to last so long in the body. Any drug, right. right? Okay, just so happens for the sympathetic nervous system, how the drug is eliminated out of the body or the effect subsides. There's an enzyme in our body called phosphodiesterase. And its responsibility is to come up here, I'm saying come up here, its responsibility is to break down 3,5 AMP. And when it breaks down 3,5 AMP, we no longer have bronchodilation effect. That's why we have to go back and administer the drug again. And it will break the drug down to 5 AMP, or not the drug, it'll break the cell down to 5 AMP. And that's homeostatic, meaning the sympathetic system is nor lying dormant, and the parasympathetic nervous system is functioning. That's what our drugs do. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, we got an asthmatic, and the asthmatic is in trouble. And this is a drug that we as respiratory therapists will not administer, but we know how it works. These dog ball wheezing, these bronchospasms will not break. It will not break, it will not break, it will not break. They won't break. The patient is still struggling. Or maybe they'll get relief for half an hour and the wheezing comes back. Release for an hour and the wheezing comes back. It won't break. This is called a bronchodilator, the xanthine drugs. I guess that's why I made that yellow too. I think that's where I was going with that anyway. Um, the xanthine drugs, they're called side door bronchodilators. By themselves, 
they are very, 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 very weak bronchodilators, so it's not our first choice to give to a patient, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but what will a xanthine drug do? A xanthine drug come from the side door, not the front door, not the back door, come from the side. What a xanthine drug will do is come up here and say, oh, you want to stop 3-5 AMP? Xanthine drugs will stop the function or inhibit the function of phosphodiesterase. Okay? Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. And if it inhibits the function, its function is to break this down, right? right. All right. So if phosphodiesterase can't break this down, that means you're going to have 3,5 AMP effect longer. So that's why it's synergistic. Phosphodiesterase is an inhibitor. I'm sorry, theophylin is an inhibitor. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And so you have to understand the function of phosphodiesterase. What does it do? Well, the responsibility of phosphodiesterase is to break this down. But if a xanthine drug is administered synergistically, it won't break this down. And as long as this is not broken down, what effect are we going to have in the body? Bronchodilation. It's administered IV. But I'm going to ask you as a, what is it? And you're going to tell me methyl xanthine drugs inhibit phosphodiesterase. And consequently, what do we have? We have a longer effect of 3,5 A and P. So this is a side door bronchodilator. It doesn't have anything to do with the sympathetic nervous system, doesn't have anything to do with the parasympathetic nervous system. But if a patient is taking a beta-2 agonist, it is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Is it yes, sir. I'm sorry. So it, it, it's it's it doesn't increase the it doesn't increase the strength of the amp drug. It just prolongs its basically. It prolongs its, its effect. Body, right? It can increase the strength. Right. It just prolongs its effect. Gotcha. Right. Will the peak effect will last longer? Okay. The peak effect will last longer, not by the true action of the drug, but by the action of the methyl xanthine. Now this is not a drug. I see your hand. This is not a drug we administer. But you go in ER, or maybe you've been working with a patient or an intensive care unit, and you see this yellow bag hanging, and it's IV, aminophilin, theophylin, you know what it is. It's synergistic to whatever you're doing. And that's why we call it a side door bronchodilator. You probably won't see it with your COPD patients, but you will see it with your asthmatic patients, because sometimes those bronchospasms won't break. Methyl xanthine drugs are phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and it will prolong the effect of 3,5 A and P. Okay? Kelly? I was just wondering if this was something, we've given the beta to notice this isn't happening, the, the, the wheezing has not stopped. Right. Is this something we could recommend to a doctor? Yeah. As a, yeah. Okay, so we can get that order and they can put it, they get mm -hmm. it going. What, what should we do? What, what, what do you want me to recommend you it not? We don't have to know the dosage. They have to figure it out, but tell them, let's try methyl xanthine or theophylline, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Yep. And then you have to, if somebody asks you, then you have to explain how it's synergistic. So you okay. got front door, that's SNS. You got back door, that's anticholinergic. Now you got side door, methyl xanthine. Yes. Is it better to recommend the back door first or before you recommend the side door? Not for an asthmatic. So the asthmatic side door might work better synergistically than mm -hmm. a back door. Mm -hmm. Or back door more for a COPD. COPD. Okay. okay. Yes. Because this deals with 3,5 AMP and that's the SNS, we give this, this is a synergistic with a beta 2 agonist, but you wouldn't give a back door and a side door, or can you? No, no, you don't. Because it's a phospho, because it, the, the, that's a good question, but anticholinergic is a decrease in 3,5 GMP. Mm -hmm. 
So phosphodiesterase is responsible for A and P. So it wouldn't even so do anything. It's not going to do anything. Uh, Aminophilin and an uh, anticholinergic drug are not going to work. So you can come in through the front door and the side door and the front door and the back door. But you can't come in the side you door. You can come, come in the front door, door and the side door with an asthmatic. Okay. You go through the front door and back door with a COPD patient. And again, we don't administer this drug, but we need to know what it is and how it works. <laughs> so it's classified as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And so to say inhibitor, okay, what does that mean? It blocks the function of phosphodiesterase, which is responsible for breaking our effect 3,5-A and P down. If it inhibits phosphodiesterase, you'll have this longer. And this is nothing but bona fide bronchodilation, right? Mm -hmm. Kyle. I was going to ask you why they just don't make it a component of adrenergic drugs, but, but why would they if it doesn't work on COPD? It would make sense just well, to it, keep it Well, it makes sense because with COPD, it's irreversible. The damage mm -hmm. is done, it's done. But it makes sense if a patient doesn't need this drug, why give it to them? Yeah. So it, it, they don't have to be. This is just for hard-headed, stubborn, wheezing. And patients are not always in it, but sometimes they do. They get in distress. And so you go to I, you go to intensive care unit or you go to ER and you'll see this yellow bag and you know what it is. All, right. All therapists know what this drug is. We don't administer it, but we know how it works, and it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Side door. Yes, ma'am. You said yellow bag. Methyl xanthine. Xanthine is a color, yellow. So it comes yellow. Okay. And it only comes, well, no, I don't, I don't want to lie. How you'll see it is IV. It will come in a pill, but uh, they don't do that too much anymore because the, there is a therapeutic dose, and we don't want to overdose a patient on the So it's not inhaled? No, it's not inhaled. It's administered IV. Okay. You'll see administered IV. And why? Because it can be administered orally, but it'll take too long. It may take three or four days to get in the system. IV is the question, is the answer. Yes. So we, that's not something that we would administer, yeah. but is that something that we recommend? Yes. Okay. You have to, and yes, and I'm going to give you scenarios, and you got to recommend it. These bronchospasms won't break. And we can't keep giving the medication. you got a patient on Q1 hour, and asthmatic. You got them on Q1 hour uh, uh, Saba. You got them on Q1 hour anticholinergic. And it's six hours later. And, or, no, I don't even say that long. Five hours, four hours later, and the wheezing hasn't broke. That's it. And it'll break. They'll break. And they may have to be on it three or four days. Is that it as far as front door, back door, side door? I mean, is, is, as far as want to come up through the basement? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What was your question? Well, yeah, that's so you, you've got basically front door, and that's boom. Those guys are gangbusters. Then you've got the back door drugs. They're they're synergistic to the guys coming through the front door. And then if they still can't get the job done, then these guys come in the side door and right. and prolong the effect of, of of the front door guys. Right. But I am sticking. Uh, more so with asthma as opposed to COPD because now we have these other drugs, Atrovent and Spiriva, for the COPD. Okay? So these patients, I've used the term staticus asthmaticus. Mm -hmm. These are asthmatic patients who no longer respond to conventional beta-2 agonist therapy and they're in ER and they're in great distress. Recommend some the Ophelin. It'll break it. I sure, it may not, you may not see it right away, but it'll break. It'll break. Got to get them out of distress. Now, this is not something a patient goes home on, but it'll break them. And so, this is why their drugs, it, it just um, miffed me last year. I had a few people in the program that actually <laughs> went to the dean and vice president on me <laughs> because I was teaching them drugs 
that they didn't need to know as a therapist. So they're not second year students. I didn't know what I'm doing. I, I didn't know, I, I couldn't know what I'm doing because I hadn't talked in the hospital or I hadn't worked as a therapist in over 10 years. So I didn't know, I don't know what I'm doing. But they never worked as long as that day. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. I said, okay, so how you all want to handle this? What you going to do? They can't be you. What are you going to do? I'm going to keep teaching. So anyway. <laughs> no, as a therapist, you would never rec you would never administer a methoxanthine drug. Never. But you want to recommend it because you understand it's side door. And you can just be honest with the physician. I, I don't know the dosage. You have to figure that out. But I'm recommending theophylline, aminophylline. I'm recommending it because it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor which will cause bronchodilation effect longer. Oh, yeah, know your stuff. Know your stuff. Because, like I said, sometimes doctors don't know. They're, they're, they're baffled. What do I order? What do I do? They're human. How long? Right, they're human and they don't know it. That's why they depend on us. And for us to know. Benefits. The more, people, more we know, the more everybody knows. Absolutely. The patients the more benefits. Right. And so, with this, and, I'm, and again, I'm not saying this to be condescending, but I'm trying to get you into buy to the value of what you're learning. It goes beyond an exam. It goes beyond an exam. And everything you're learning, you're going to use. And it seems like a lot, but once you start practicing, it, it, it's become, you know, you know that old bathrobe full of lint? <clears throat> My sister boy used to work at uh, Walt Disney, and she got a, Tremendous discount, and I have. I was much bigger, but she bought me a bathrobe that has Minnie Mouse on it. Minnie Mouse is hanging off, and she's got lint balls all around here. I still love it; keeps me warm. Okay, so my point is that's how you'll be in respiratory care. The more you do it, the more you understand it. Okay, so uh, xanthine drugs are side door bronchodilators. They don't have a direct effect on bronchodilation. They do not. And then also, one other thing I want to, um, well, two other things. Look on page 139. See the serum levels of theophylline? Mm -hmm. No effects less than 5 milligrams per milliliter. Therapeutic range for theophylline is 10 to 20. And see, if we start going above, nausea, 20 milligrams, cardiac arrhythmia, see, it can have a direct effect on the heart. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to overdose. So the thing, this is a drug that patients don't go home on because it has to be a therapeutic dose in the body. So we only, when I say we, doctors will only prescribe this drug while the patient's in distress and they need to come off the drug before they go home. And I'm not saying they come off the drug the day they go home. They need to come off this drug a day before and be in the hospital still 24 more hours where we're administering our beta-2 agonists to make sure that they're out of distress before we send them home. Because if they just pulled out the IV and said, okay, go home, they could be in distress within three or four hours again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or depending on the therapeutic dose. So this is a drug that we have to be careful because it can be toxic. But nevertheless, if the therapeutic dose is maintained, it will work with beta-2 agonists for those doggone, hard-headed, rebellious bronchospasms that just won't break with a typical beta-2 agonist. So in some cases, beta-2 agonists alone is not the answer. Some cases, it is not the answer. So the yes, patient sir. needs. I'm sorry. So the patient needs what? Just close monitoring while they're being administered yeah. this way. Yeah. And so what are you going to do? You're going to have your stethoscope continue, continually monitoring those breath sounds. And how often did you, did you see that when you were working as an nurse? All the time. You, all the time, because you got to remember now, to be very, very honest with you, as a registered therapist, I've never had the opportunity to use Atrovent or Spiriva. I've been an educator for 31 years. But you have seen them use the, the theo, theophylline there. I, 
Ah, Theophilin. Theophilin. If you're going to walk it, you got to talk. I'm getting better. I'm trying. Yeah, well, you can't go nowhere talking to Theophilin. <laughs> <laughs> it's Theophilin. Apparently not. Theophilin. <laughs> I did come up with a new drug this morning. Yeah, I, and I do. I make up words, Kyle. I understand. I'm, my sister said, that's not a word. I said, well, it sounds good to me. <laughs> there you go. I see it. You'll see it used. And I, I, the, the, the another point that I want to make, let's turn. Well, you can read page 141, use and asthma. Read that. And... Uh, turn to page 142. Use is in acne of prematurity. This is the babies. Babies that are born sometime and they forget to breathe. They'll give theophylline. Why? Because theophylline has caffeine in it. And the caffeine will stimulate the baby to breathe. So I'm going to ask you that. I don't care about a dosage, but in neonates, if a baby is experiencing apnea in prematurity. They're born premature and they have a tendency to be acnic. What do you recommend? And in this case, it's not a bronchodilator. What does caffeine do for you? Stimulate. Stimulate. Stimulate them to breathe. Come on, breathe. So they'll give the baby uh, the oxygen. Is it? I generally don't mess with, I don't bother, that's Miss Pope's terrain, uh, but it's appropriate. So it's two uses as therapists. Do, th do therapists in NICU administer theophylline to babies? No, but you need to know what's happening. You need to know why they're getting it. So in adults, it's a side door bronchodilator for those uh, bronchoconstrictions that won't break using our beta-2 drugs. And then for babies who experience an apnea because they're born prematurely, it's a caffeine or respiratory stimulant to them to provoke them, to stimulate them to breathe. That's all I want you to know. Phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And if it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, you'll have this effect longer. And that is simply bronchodilation. See why I started early? I think the second week in this, because now I have to explain it. You understand. That's how our drugs work, and we understand it. Now, you don't have to talk about 3,5-AMP and phosphodiesterase inhibitor and all this to your patients, but you understand how these drugs are working. Okay, let's look at the bottom of page 142, Respiratory Care Assessment of Xanthines. Assess the effectiveness of drug therapy on the basis of indications for the aerosol agent. Presence of reversible airflow resulting, see reversible? That's asthma. That's asthma. COPD is not reversible, right? Okay. So the presence of reversible bronchospasms resulting, I'm sorry, from primary bronchospasms or obstruction secondary to inflammatory response or secretions. Inflammatory response. What's the first um, mechanism that you've learned for uh, bronchoconstrictions? Wheezing. Bronchoconstrictions is wheezing. What's the first mechanism? I heard somebody just say well, that. Mast cell, cell degranulation. And who, what kind of patient is that? Asthmatic. 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 But now in here we see inflammatory response or secretions. What's the second? Secretions. 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 And what's the third? Inflammatory. Inflammatory response. See why I kept telling you this? Here they are. These are the causes of bronchospasm. So it doesn't matter whether it's an asthmatic who's had been exposed to allergens and they're having, they're experiencing mast cell degranulation or they could have excessive secretions or it could be inflammatory. And you say, I, I, I see Laurel's mind ticking right now. Well, why don't they give the anti-inflammatory anti drug? 
Maybe they have and it's still not breaking. Give them a xanthine drug. Get them off the xanthine drug as soon as possible and continue with your anti-inflammatory and beta-2 agonists. Okay? So what am I saying? Sometime, depending upon the severity of the condition or the acuteness or the exacerbation, beta-2 agonists won't break it. Anti-inflammatories won't break it. Give them meth methylxanthines along with it synergistically, and it'll break. So that's why they have the new research going on for phosphodiatrid inhibitors, new drugs are coming. So. Exactly. And they're going to go through the side door now. Exactly. But what defeats the whole purpose of all of this? Cigarette smoke. <laughs> Make sense? So they're coming up with new, doing research right now on new phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Why? Because with xanthine drugs, patients generally don't go home on those drugs. Those are drugs that are administered in the hospital and the patients have to be monitored. But if we give it long enough, I don't know how long it's going to take, they're going to come up with something orally and it won't be toxic. Yep. Is the reason we don't give it is it because it isn't an IV form? And we won't no, it comes in pill form, but if there's a, a, a probability or a possibility. If you look back on page, page 139 under serum levels of theoclin, look at the third bullet on 139. Nausea greater than 20 milli, it has to be monitored in the blood. Oh, okay. Okay, because it can be toxic. It can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, and then it can cause seizures if too much is administered. So you really have to monitor. So it has to be monitored. That's why we only administer in the hospital now. And then a side effect. Now, my oldest sister was on uh, theophylline for a long time, younger. She shook all the time. Side effect was tremors. And the older she got, she had to come off of it because it made her shake. She couldn't even write because she was shaking all the time. I have an aunt that was on slow, slow fulling. Slow did bed. The, did the same thing same to thing. her. And, the, and they've learned, we've learned, so patients don't go home on these medications. Now, this was before the anticholinergics. Oh, so this used to be back <laughs> This door. used to be the wonderful thing. This used to be backdoor, but it's not anymore because you got to remember because it's a respiratory stimulant, it's doing other things. And it has a direct effect on the heart. It's toxic. So that's why we now have anticholinergic drugs. And we still use this, but it's controlled in the hospital. There are some drugs that are only administered in a hospital because it has to be monitored. Other than the EpiPen, you'll never see pa patients on epinephrine otherwise. No. Never, ever. So when you say therapeutic dose, is that only a dose given in the hospital? When I say therapeutic dose, or it says serum level, serum level means a therapeutic dose or amount of the drug in the blood. Okay. If the amount of the drug in the blood is toxic, the patient is going to start having side effects, mm -hmm. nausea, headache, cardiac arrhythmias, and tremors, and seizures. It, when we get above the therapeutic dose, it's toxic to the body. Okay. Okay. And the side effects are greater than the intended use. So what good is it that you're not wheezing, but now you're having seizures? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, any questions with Xanthines? All right, let's look at this again. Go back to page 142. Respiratory assessment. The second bullet says monitor flow rates with peak flow meters. Why? Because you're dealing with an asthmatic, right? And they need to know their peak flow. All right. On the basis of pulmonary function, oh, here's this word, before and after bronchodilator studies. See it? I told you what that is, before and after PFT to assess the reversibility of airflow obstruction. Perform respiratory assessment. You count the respiratory rate. You listen to the breath sounds before, during, and after treatment. That's patient assessment. 
all right? And it says assess serum blood levels of agent. That means assess, the physician will order and get a serum theophylline level. Okay, let's look at the top of 143. Assess the patient's subjective reaction to treatment for any change in breathing effort or pattern. What is subjective data? What the, what the patient, patient says. says. How do you feel? Are you still short of breath? Is this making you breathe easier? Okay. Assess blood gases. Ooh, really? Assess blood gases. Okay. Or if you don't want to do a blood gas, a pulse ox saturation. For acute stages with asthma, to monitor changes in ventilation, which we'll look at the PCO2, and to monitor changes in oxygenation, which we'll look at the PO2. See, it's all coming together. So here we got pharmacology, we got PFTs, we got blood gases, and patient assessment. It all goes together. You don't do anything to a patient and not assess the patient. Just because you gave it, and when I say you, I don't mean you personally, it doesn't mean it's going to work. How do you know whether it's going to work or not? Assess your patient. All right? Someone wrote that, what they wanted to know. It's not time. Only what I give you. That's next semester, pathophysiology one. So don't even, fret, don't even worry about uh, patient assessment. Okay, under long term, <laughs> under long term it says monitor pulmonary function testing of lung volumes, capacities, and flows. These are always flows. It's asthma, they have an obstructive disease, here it flows. So PFTs are tied in very heavily with what we do with uh, asthmatic and COPD patients. Okay, the third bullet, patient education. Patient education emphasizes that xanthines do not treat underlying inflammation or prevent asthma. Just short term, give it to them now. So they can't go home on this drug. And under general contraindications, under that first bullet, overdosing is possible. Overdosing is possible. So this drug, that means if this drug goes beyond therapeutic level of 10 to 20 milligrams, it can be toxic and it's not going to work. It can be toxic. And when I say not going to work, let me rephrase that. It will work. The patient will still have the bronchodilation, but then they can have a cardiac arrest, or they can start having seizures. And what good is to breathe easy, but then you have a cardiac arrest? Yeah. Or what good is it to breathe easy, and then you're having seizures? Okay, so the side effects, again, become more uh, prominent than the intended use. Does that make sense? All mm -hmm. right, so now you got front door bronchodilators, you got back door bronchodilators, you've learned a side door bronchodilator, and you know about anti inflammatory drugs. Four, we've got them down, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, close your books. Let's spread eagle. <laughs>